Next on the Broadway show, there's life after Romeo. I'm talking to one of the stars of the new pop concert musical and Juliet, Palo Shot. Plus, Pulitzer Prize winner Cost of Living is on Broadway just a few more weeks. We'll chat with one of the stars, Kate Sullivan. And we dreamed a dream come true. We're with the stars of the new Les Mes U.S. tour. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show. Each and every week, we're excited to bring you The Broadway Show. That's why I'm so glad you're here. I'm Tamsin Fidel. We've talked about it before, but five different Pulitzer Prize winners are on Broadway this fall. That list includes Cost of Living. It's a look into the forces that bring people together, the complexity of caring and being cared for, and the ways that we all need each other. Let's send it out to Paul Wontorek. That's right, Tamsin. Cost of Living marks Katie Sullivan's Broadway debut. We sat down at Sardis to talk all about her incredible journey to the stage and beyond. So nice to meet you. Welcome Likewise. to Broadway. Thank you so much. You know, you've been on this journey to bring this play to Broadway for how many years? It's been about six years at this point, a little over six years um, from when I first got the script. And I'm sure when you got that script, you didn't say, this is going to bring me to Broadway. <laughs> I don't think anybody ever, when you get a new script of any sort, you don't, I don't think you dream of that. But what I did think when I got the script is how unbelievably authentic, groundbreaking and real it was. And it terrified me, this character, her vulnerability, mm. her, um, what she's been through. Um, and then having to put a big mask on all of that with like humor and things like that. I was like, this is terrifying. I should probably do it. Yes, yeah, she is a lot. The phrase that the kids use, zero, zero Fs to give, right? There's a lot of that energy in, in her. A hundred percent. I think, I mean, I feel like Ani has been through so much in terms of uh, what her relationship has already gone through with the sobriety and not yeah. being sober and all of these things and splitting up and getting divorced. And then on top of it, having this huge catastrophic accident that yeah. leaves her life completely turned upside down. Yeah. So coming at a character who's been through the gauntlet yeah. of life experience, there's very little that you have to do. It's all just sitting in the given circumstances is enough. The disability is almost like not the most interesting thing about her, which is what's so great about it for you, I'm sure, as an I, actress. I've done a lot of uh, TV work where it's sort of the, it's either you're a um, hero or like a tragic, something tragic's about to, you're right. about to be crushed by right. something or you've rescued a kitten from a tree or something like that. I mean, it's like, and there's almost no nothing in between, but to get this three-dimensional character who's flawed, who's angry, who, who's not looked at as a victim or a hero was extraordinary. And she's in a wheelchair. You are not in a wheelchair. You actually had to learn how to, how to be in a wheelchair for the role. Yeah, and she has different circumstances than I, than yeah. I do. She's um, a quadriplegic, so she is paralyzed from the neck down. Um, one of her arms has no movement. So like, it's this whole kind of game that I've had to figure out physically of how does one sit still? And it is way more complicated and, and way harder than it looks <laughs> to, right. to have all of this going on all of this emotion, uh, volume to fill a house and remain perfectly still. You were born without the lower halves of your legs. And from everything I've read, you, you've actually been extremely active since since you were a baby, right? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I, I started to, I got my first pair of prosthetics when I was one because I just started to stand up like babies are like, we got stuff wow. to do, like my bottle's over there, I gotta get it. So like my parents just sort of let me set the bar and they followed me and they were like, okay, she wants to walk, she wants to run, she wants to, you know, they let me kind of really fall on my face and try things and get figure out how to get back up and keep going. And and I think that that really has played a huge role in, in just my character and my life as an adult and a professional. You discovered acting really early on. It sounds like it became a dream when, when you were pretty young. I think when you saw Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> yes, I saw a, a children's theater production in Alabama of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory when I was probably in like second grade. And the girl who played Violet went to my school. It, it was like my brain exploded because I was like, wait, this is something that- How did she do that? How did I she could do, do that? that? And I was sort of like, you know, hold my juice box. <laughs> like, you know, let me up there. 
I, it's all I've ever, ever wanted to do. I saw my first um, Broadway show when I was 17. I was on a school trip. We were leaving the theater and I just was sobbing wow. uncontrollably. And my teacher came over and she was like, thought something had happened. She was like, what's wrong? What's going on? And I was like, I just want to do that so badly. <laughs> like I just, it's all I've ever wanted to do. But at that point in my life, I mean, obviously earlier, but even at 17, I had no one to point to, to say, this is possible. And I'm really glad that there are little girls out there now that have someone to yeah. point to and they can say, no, 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 this is possible. Are you feeling more doors being opened now? There's a lot more um, discussion, I think, about all kinds of diversity in, right. in, in with performers. What are you sort of hoping moving forward? I mean, I, I'm picturing you in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I mean, I would rock a <laughs> latex suit like no one else. I, I would feel like that'd be incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so let's I put would, that yes, on the list. Right? I think that people are hungry for authenticity. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, we're really starting to get tired of seeing, you know, I, the first time I ever saw anyone who physically looked like me in a film was, you know, Gary Sinise and Forrest Gump and nothing says I feel seen like uh, to a teenage girl, but like a, you know, a veteran alcoholic who's paying hookers for sex. Like that's like, I feel And seen. it's all CGI. Right, and he's wearing green socks, which is what I found out later. Cause I was a teenage, you know, I didn't know. Right, I was like, right. oh my gosh, there is someone. Right. And then when I found out that it yeah. was CGI, I was like devastated. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. And so I think we are at a tipping point where people are interested in in the realness of telling a story and not sitting an able-bodied person in a wheelchair and then you know giving them an oscar what about audience members have you been able to see the impact you're having and it will probably be far reaching way beyond even the run of the show there have been a couple of times there specifically there was a young girl who was standing outside the theater she had forearm crutches and she just said I, I just have to thank you because I had never I've never seen anything like that before and she was like I'm really interested in acting and I I didn't think it was possible and I was like please don't give up I was like don't give up take classes go get a you know get jump into a scene study class study because that's the other thing that specifically in the community of individuals with disabilities mm -hmm. is training. Luck is just opportunity meeting preparedness and people need to be prepared mm -hmm. to get up there and be ready for the moment. Right. All your phone calls, all the side texts, tearing up my jeans like the talons of a T-Rex. A brand new Radio Ready pop musical is now on Broadway. K-pop brings the sounds of the South Korean pop musical phenomenon to Broadway. It's an electrifying production that will mark the Broadway debut of a real K-pop chart topper Luna. For tickets and more info, head over to Broadway.com. Shakespeare just got a pop music rewrite, and Juliet puts a new twist on the story of the Romeo and Juliet heroine. It features a whole lot of pop anthems that you know and love. I caught up with Broadway faith, Paolo Schott. So I want to start out for audiences that don't know the story of Anne Juliet. Can you set that up for us? Absolutely. It's a story of a girl that wakes up one day and decides not to kill herself because her lover killed himself. So she decides to have a life. And all this is written by William Shakespeare and his wife, Anne Hathaway. Of course, it's a comedy. It's a vision of how would life would look like for a young girl uh, when she makes that decision and she decides to have her own life and not to take her own life because of a boyfriend. I feel like now <laughs> of all times to hear that empowerment for women, it yeah. has to feel so strong, right? Absolutely. And it's a show about respect, about uh, having all kinds of people in the show, you know, and uh, seeing them for being just people. And uh, it's so important, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to take this, this musical is because I play a father to uh, a son that needs his father to see him for what he is. Mm -hmm. It was an opportunity to play one of those dads that are out there still. And um, it made me think we are in 2022 right. and uh, if kids are still struggling 
with their parents not seeing for who they are, I want to contribute and to tell that story too. It's my life, it's now or never, and I ain't gonna last forever. I mean, I love the fact that, you know, uh, there's a, such an important message in this show, but then there's also so much fun in this, in this well, show. Well, it's a comedy. It's a brilliant yeah. comedy written by David West Reed that we all know from uh, Schitt's Creek. It's filled with uh, wonderful moments. I have so much fun. I had from the first moment that I started to read the script, you know, I cried and I, and I, and I at the same time, I could, couldn't stop laughing. And we are very blessed to have all these wonderful actors with me to share the stage with me, like Stark Sands, like Betsy Wolf, like Melanie LaBarry, who came from the original production of And Juliet in the UK. So to have these people around me, you know, because it's something that it's not exactly on my uh, repertoire, sure. you know, as an opera singer and then as a uh, leading man in South Pacific. <laughs> To have this opportunity to do comedy is just a blessing. Those are two very different audiences, right? Yeah. So how is this to be going from opera audience to Broadway fans? And Broadway fans are fun. They want they want to be part of the show. That's two different worlds. Uh, the operatic crowd is more of uh, they want to listen to the music, mm -hmm. and they usually don't don't do any kind of noise. Not that the Broadway crowd don't want to listen to the music and to the story, but they want to participate. And we in the show are welcoming from the first moment people to be inserted on the stage and, and in the story. So it's very nice to have um, people singing along yep. because you know the, this musical is filled <laughs> with great songs. Do you ever think you'd be singing a Katy Perry song on stage? Oh yeah, <laughs> it's the best bit. This show, is this the most razzle-dazzle? I know you did Chicago, right. but is this the most razzle-dazzle it's gotta be uh, for absolutely. a show? Absolutely, absolutely, because you know, I think there are so many uh, plot twists in the middle of it and uh, the surprises, even for my character. People get absolutely surprised by the things that we, we do on stage. I think I have never done anything that was so much fun for me as an artist too. So let me ask you this, and I don't know if I'm gonna use the words right, but do you ever use your operatic, is it operatic voice in this show? That was a question. Okay. You know, when we first started to rehearse, I thought, because the character is French, yeah. uh, and I thought of, of bringing this French voice, uh, speaking French voice and singing French voice, and then uh, our music supervisor said, no, bring your operatic voice. And I said, I'm on it for it. And uh, <laughs> it works, you know, it's very, very funny. Can you give us any part of it or we'll, we'll shatter glass? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Come to the show. Okay. I won't put the pressure on you. Uh, you're a Tony winner as well. I feel like you've done three very different shows on Broadway. It's Absolutely. Kind of, I mean, you know, two that are very, very well known. One that I think is going to be very quickly. Yeah, you know, the, the first appearance was, was with South Pacific sure. and a show that ran for two and a half years. It was the first revival mm -hmm. of South Pacific and uh, the last. But uh, people still talk about that show with a beautiful Kelly O'Hara on it. Yeah, they do. They sure do. I remember going by that, that scene at Marquee <laughs> all the time. Right. It feels good to be back on Broadway? Absolutely, yes. Every time that I come here, I'm very humble, very happy to be part of this wonderful community. We're taking a look at another one of the amazing shows soon to be headed to Broadway. A Beautiful Noise starts performances in November. Will Swenson plays Neil Diamond in the musical that charts the singer's rise to stardom. Last album in the works for A Beautiful Noise, set to release digitally November 2nd, the same day A Beautiful Noise begins previews. This is a Broadway show and we're back in just a few. One day more, one more time. A new multi-year touring production of Les Mis just hit the road. Charlie Cooper's here with the stars. Thanks, Tamsin. Nick Cartel and Preston Truman Boyd are bringing the epic musical Les Mis to a city near you. I got to chat with them at the Civilian Hotel. 
Nick and Preston, super excited to have you guys here, but especially excited with the relaunch of Le Mis yeah. kicking off in October. Can you guys kind of tell us a little bit about how you guys are feeling right now? Whew. It's been a long time coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think that, that everybody is so ready to get back into the theater, right? And I know for us especially, we are so ready to get back to work. We are ready to take a show like this, an epic show like Les Mis that connects with so many people and take it back across the country. You know, I feel like now coming back to this, it's so important to really focus on the storytelling and to be able to be together and to kind of make a pact as a cast to be like, we're gonna tell this story, the country needs to hear this story and we're all just so honored to be at the helm of it. Do you guys think being off of the stage or taking a little bit of time off of the stage has changed you guys in any way? I mean, from yeah, I think for both of us. I mean, me especially, uh, not only pandemic, but then I also had a baby during the pandemic. So now, d playing Valjean, playing this character that becomes a father in the show, now that I am a father, oh, things are hitting me much differently than they did before. I, I, we were singing a line from the show the other day, and I was just all of a sudden got teared up and choked up. And so just revisiting this material now with this new take of being a dad is, is so interesting. You guys, of course, are returning to your respective roles, but when you first took on those roles, was it a little nerve wracking to know that you would be a part of a show that means so much to so many people? It's a huge responsibility to take that on and to, you know, to uh, embody these, these people that are such a huge part of a story that so many people need to hear is an honor. As an actor, it's really exciting to to push yourself in that way and to see how far you can really become somebody uh, that that is a part of this really great story. And we also have a responsibility to this material, right? I mean, the show's been running for over 35 years. And so every time you go into a new city, everybody remembers the first time that they saw Les Mis, right? Either the 10th anniversary concert, the 25th anniversary concert, or a production that toured before. So we have a responsibility to not only to that material and to bring these characters to life, and that I think is what is also thrilling is that we get to reinvent who we think these characters are and hope that they connect with our audiences. The beauty of bringing it on the road is being able to interact with different audiences, seeing how they, they react to the show. What are you guys most excited about as far as just bringing this to people all, all across the country? The thing that I love is that we have, like I said before, we've, we have audience members that have seen the show before, mm -hmm. right? And maybe the first time they saw the show, they connected with characters like Marius and Cosette and Eponine because they were teenagers or they were seeing it, you know, in their teen years. But now they're parents and they're connecting with Valjean and Javert and Fantine and the sacrifices that those characters are making and they're bringing their children to see the show and their children are connecting with these characters. And so it just, it really creates full circle moments for families. And, and I think the conversations that come out of those moments are, are what is so remarkable about a show like this that has stood the test of time. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. The Rockettes are back at Radio City in New York. And we just got a look at a newly reimagined scene from the Christmas spectacular, Dance of the Frost Fairies. It's part of the Rockettes' kickoff to Christmas. We asked if you were Broadway's biggest fan and you answered the call. Thousands of videos submitted from fans vying for their chance to be crowned Broadway's biggest fan of that year. Meet the exciting winner. Hi, I'm Miss Charlotte, Broadway's biggest fan. I've been a dance teacher for over 50 years. <laughs> By being a teacher, I can share the joy with others and how to become a part of uh, life, which is in itself a Broadway production. <laughs> I love the front row, front and center, because it's balanced. When I'm watching them, I watch this side and I go to the middle and I keep going. Some of the theaters that know me now <laughs> say they know I do that and one gentleman said they talk about that. So he watched and he missed his cue, but his fellow actor covered for him. One of my dance students, who's now a teacher, said she found this online and she said, uh, we'll enter together. And I said, well, I can't talk about myself. And she said, I have a plan. Then when she sent it and we uh, became one of the finalists. And then there was the uh, audition with two Broadway actors and Julie James. 
they were wonderful. <laughs> It makes me cry every time I think of how they did. All three were fantastic, but it was my time. Thank you so much. I, your company is just wonderful, and it's one of the most positive things in the world to help everybody feel positive about what is happening every day in their lives. That's going to do it for us, but until next time, check out The Broadway Show Uncut wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show.